Roxy Soxy. Good morning, Tam Tam. How How's are it you? Going? How's it been for you in this last couple of days of, uh, it's been disheartening, hasn't it? It has. It really has. This, this whole week actually has been quite eye-opening and, um, you know, there's something coming out every, you know, every other day and it's just, it's a lot of information to take in. So I am so thankful we have the guest on today who we have on today because he, he will hopefully help guide us through some of this. Um, his name is Echo Yanka. He's a professor at um, Cordoza School of Law. He holds many, um, many degrees from Columbia, Oxford, just to name a few. Um, he goes regularly on TV, talks about um, race relations, chem- uh, criminal justice reform, um, sits on the board of the Innocence Project. So we are very, very um, excited to have him come come speak with us today. So welcome. Welcome, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for thank having you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, to say this week has been difficult is quite the understatement. I feel like everybody is going through um, navigating through different emotions this week, you know, um, none of which are are easy. Um, just to kind of go back to the beginning of the week, um, it is very painful, but um, just to kind of gauge how you were feeling um, when this sort of week started, um, what was your reaction when you saw the tape of, of what happened to George Floyd? Um, it's difficult. These, mm-hmm. these are horrifying and difficult. Um, it's emotionally exhausting. Mm-hmm. It wears on you. Um, you know, look, I think like many people who, who have to think about this and deal with it, it's a reminder that violence, especially violence against black men, can reach into your life wherever you are, anytime, can sort of reach across a country and a dinner table and um, blow up your day, your mood. Um, it reminds you that you can, um, you know, you have the sort of low level constant anxiety that one day you'll be mm. in your in law's barn getting something and somebody will mm. think you're out of place and things will quickly escalate. Um, It makes you hug your boys tighter. Um, Yeah. And and as bad as any of it is, to be really honest, um, for me, because it's my work, part of the exhaustion is that you can't look away. Um, Mm -hmm. I suppose none of us should look away. I mean, you do have to take breaks to restore your sanity, but when it's also part of your job, you feel sort of like you're stuck watching it. And then on top of all that, it is really, really deeply exhausting when you cannot distinguish in your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed um, which unjustified killing of a black person they're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, so was that tweet about um, uh, Ms. Taylor, Mr. Floyd, Mr. Arbor, was that about a past death, you know, is this reference to I can't breathe about um, Eric Garner or is it about George Floyd? And mm-hmm. there's a sort of um, exhausting, exhausting, uh, uh, never ending this to it. You said that our ability to see humanity stops at racial lines. When you said that, it it broke me because what what is it going to take for our world to change? Like, it, it, are we just going to have these riots and everyone speaking out and sharing on social media and then it goes back to normal? Like, how, how are we really going to change? Because this has happened before mm-hmm. and then life just keeps going. So, so what now? Like, what do we do? I mean, so I think you're, you're exactly right. The part of the exhaustion of this is, you know, look, one of the things I do in my professional life is I write on political theory. And that means that I'm often uh, arguing about things that happened, you know, a hundred years ago, or sometimes 2000 years ago. Um, And so I, I'm pessimistic when people say this time it's different because Mm -hmm. When you read things over and over and over, you think, well, you know, we constantly say this time it's different. Um, What matters, of course, is that, A, we understand what politics really is, right? Politics is about 
um, collective, consistent, and structural action. And so if what people get out of this stuff is, well, let's just wait for everything to calm down, or worse yet, um, the kind of reaction some people have, you know, this is so sad, now's not the time to talk about politics, or let's not politicize right. this. No, no, let's politicize this, right? <laughs> it's about changing the, the things that uh, are consistently around us. So if the attitude is... Um, well, it's too soon after his death to talk about politics. And then when things are slightly calmer, it's, oh, why are you bringing that up? You're being dis- dismissive. Then we're going to be stuck right where we are. It's only the moments where we've used uh, really tragic, explosive, painful violence to make at least real steps forward. Um, think of the Civil Rights Bill in 64 and 68. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not perfect and they didn't solve everything, but those are moments where you didn't, you returned to a better normal than the one you had before. Um, judging from where we are right now with all of the, the, the discord and the, the hatred and the pain, do you see us moving to a more positive place um, at some point? I don't know how long it would take. I, I, you know, is there a way to navigate that? You know, look, if I had the answers, you know, right. I, I run for office. Um, right. <laughs> I think, you, you know, here's what I think. Um, it, it's a hard kind of thing. How do we navigate that? Mm-hmm. I think what's true is we need people to stop being so willfully blind about these issues. Mm-hmm. Um, you see the ease with which we, you know, uh, Tam, Tam, you were just saying how uh, I've written that our humanity is racially, it's too often viewed through racial lens. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one common meme today, which is important, is to compare the way in which white protesters are treated and black protesters are mm-hmm. treated. But that's not just a meme, it's about humanity. When you see a bunch of white protesters furious at their governor and wanting to open up a state mm. in the middle of the pandemic, you know, I don't mock that. I find it frustrating. I find it upsetting. I think it's wrongheaded, but I don't mock it. I get how frustrating it must be, or I can imagine how frustrating it's be or how terrifying it is mm-hmm. to not open your shop and be afraid that you're not going to make your rent bill or not be able to sure that you can, um, you can, yeah, put clothes on your kids' back. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is stunning how, for example, the police see the humanity there. They really understand mm-hmm. these are frustrated, angry people, and it is our job to make sure everybody gets home from this safe. When it's black protesters, right, so many Americans are quick to say, oh, no, of course it's sad, but oh, gosh, you know, if only they didn't X, if only they didn't Y, if only... They were the pro- if only they were like king, if only they were like this, mm-hmm. if only that is the kind of deep seated ability to see the other side and make space for, uh, especially between police and civilians, mm-hmm. um, evidence with white people just is, is just absent. Mm-hmm. When people say or they hashtag all lives matter, and of course, obviously, all lives do matter, but I feel like they're negating the fact that systemically white lives have mattered more. What do you say to people that share that viewpoint? Because it's like they haven't taken their own lenses off and actually seen the world for what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find it just, you know, as a reply, all lives matter is just so deeply obnoxious. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's that's really incredibly self-regarding. Mm-hmm. So, look, you know, it's it's a pleasure to be invited on by uh, two young women. And, um, you know, so just to take an obvious example, let's say we were at a breast cancer rally. Um, mm-hmm. And a group of women were standing up and discussing, you know, the trauma of breast cancer. Maybe somebody's had a mastectomy. Maybe somebody's lost somebody. Um, and then I were to solemnly stand up and say, but you know, men get breast cancer too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what the statistic is. Maybe mm-hmm. 10% of the breast cancer patients are men. Maybe it's 50. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Um, but what we know is, you know, many, many fewer men get breast cancer than women. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if I did that, you just all know how deeply self-centered I was. Like, and this is, you know, you don't go to somebody's funeral and say, oh, yes, but I too have lost somebody. It's, you know, it's so obviously obnoxious. And so I, I'm a bit befuddled at how deeply insecure you have to be that when you live in this country and you hear somebody say Black Lives Matter, the only thing you can hear is, oh, they're somehow saying white lives don't matter. Mm-hmm. You have to be so anxious and so, you know, if some, forgive me, I know I'm harping on the same thing, but if some woman told me breast cancer is terrible, and my first and overriding thought was, yes, but what about if I get breast cancer? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You would just be, you'd be fucked. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it start, though, with the education? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Roxy and I have two small young daughters who are six years old, and it starts at the home. Mm-hmm. So that the next generation, I mean, hopefully, my hope is that each generation gets better and understands more and gets more educated mm-hmm. and knows about our past history so that they can inform our future generation. And if this education isn't happening in the home, then it's like I always say to my mom, like she's a very strong Christian. I say, well, what about places where there's no way to get the message? Like, does that mean that they're right or wrong? It's that they haven't been informed because they haven't learned and they haven't been able to get that education and that information. I think it starts at the home and at the baseline of us as parents to try to educate our children from a very young age Mm -hmm. because there's 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 things that people might not even know that they're doing like you go to a neighborhood and you go well lock the door it's sketchy you're already putting a certain belief and a bias into your family home without even knowing that you're doing it Mm-hmm. No, look, I think that's right. But I would take it one step further. I think not only is it a matter of having to, um, to teach in our home, but it's a matter of being dedicated to teaching. Mm-hmm. That is just, that's true. Um, yeah. it, look, so I'll tell you the experience of, well, I'll tell you one experience. It's my experience. So when I was a young academic, um, mm-hmm. I would be at you know, some conference or workshop, and we'd be having a very serious discussion on which there was an obvious racial component Mm -hmm. and often I wouldn't bring up the racial component and Mm -hmm. I'll tell you it wasn't because I was scared or nervous to be really honest Um, it was because I thought the racial component was so blisteringly obvious that it was not worth mentioning right it was just Mm -hmm. so plainly known Uh, well look you know when we're talking about entrepreneurship you know one reason we might want to think about why there are fewer black entrepreneurs is it might be the case that Black people have less family money and thus can't take a flyer when they're 24 on a project Mm -hmm. because, you know, if it doesn't work out, they have no fallback. But anyway, let's move on to, anyway, I would say something like that and the room would go silent. Mm -hmm. And the room would go silent because people would say, oh, I never thought of that. So, you know, when we talk about educating, one of the things that shocks Black people constantly is how, how little white people often, and you know, forgive me for speaking these generalities, of course, there are white people who spend their lives dedicated to racial justice and information. There are people who are very thoughtful and knowledgeable. But what is true is if you're white in America, you're just allowed to think about race very rarely. Mm-hmm. And if somebody mentions such a thing, and it is a total shock to you, mm-hmm. then in part, you aren't even working to educate yourself and you can't educate your kid. Just one last example. Look, when you're walking through the streets, your kids notice that a disproportionate number of people in, if you're in a city, for example, a disproportionate number of the panhandlers are black, right? Or Hispanic or whatever the case may be. That's true in most, not all, but most cities, many cities. Let me put it that way. It's true in my New York. If you're not talking to your kids about why that came to be, your mm-hmm. children are internalizing a lesson about who's at the natural bottom of the social hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Not talking to your kids about why, you know, why is it that so many of the black families live in the poor part of town? Why is this part of town sketchy? Mm-hmm. What redlining look like? What did the GI Bill do for white Americans when they came back? 
uh, from wars in order to start an American middle class. What did white flight look like? Um, mm-hmm. the schools in the inner city looking one way and property values in schools looking the other way. If you are not, not just bringing these things, not just bringing them up when they're forced on you, but actively educating your kids about why these things look the way they do, then your children will be one of those children in a workshop 30 years from now who say that never occurred. You know, I'm so glad we're talking about this because because that was one of the things that um, that I've had questions about is the education, because I think I can't again, this is a generalization. I'm just basically speaking about our own household. You know, I come from a cultural background. My father's Pakistani. I, you know, I thought that I grew up in sort of a very, you know, culturally aware house. Um, we instill that in our daughter now. You know, she knows her heritage. We we teach her about it. We go to a very, uh, Tam and I, our children are both at the same school, very ethnically diverse. Um, and we love that and we embrace that. And diversity is is everything, you know? So um, I think the assumption was, oh, because we also lead by example because we have friends of, of every, you know, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, that leading by example is enough for children to learn the difference um, and, and how to treat people. But it really isn't, is it? It's it, it's it's a lot deeper than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, look, mm-hmm. I'm a parent too. I get it. By the way, by pure coincidence, my wife is also half Pakistani. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Decorations in the back. I I saw that. I was like, hmm. I wonder. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so you know, I have these children who are you know white Pakistani and mm-hmm. Guinean American. Americans um, and like all parents, it's not fun to talk about. It's especially not fun to talk to young boys about why people might not always treat them fairly. Mm-hmm. It's not fun for to talk to young boys about why they should not touch things that aren't theirs. It's not mm-hmm. fun. You know, one thing that black men often internalize is that you're raising your black boys not for the encounter they have at six, but for the encounter they'll have at twelve when mm-hmm. somebody is. 15. Um, and those are not fun moments, but they're, well, they, they are the world in which we live. So look, my point was going to be, I totally, you know, no parent wants to have those conversations. We all like the kind of softer feeling that if we are just good, nice people, um, these problems will go away. But this kind of, uh, I call it racial libertarianism, right? The kind of idea that if we do nothing and we're just mm-hmm. nice enough, then all these problems will go away. The worst version of the worst version of it is if we're all nice, maybe everybody will marry everybody else. <laughs> Caramel version, and that you know, if if that's our best hope for solving these problems, um, that's just to say we're not serious about solving these problems. Mm-hmm. We have to take it upon ourselves to do more than that. How do you start a conversation about race when you have friends or family that aren't in line with your beliefs and values? How, how do you begin that conversation? And especially when you might be afraid to lose them, which again, if you're losing people over these types of conversations, maybe they shouldn't be in your life in the first place. But yeah. but how do you begin? No, look, I get it. I, I, I get how, why that's hard. Um, and, you know, look, and there's a part of me that agrees with you. There, there have to be, especially, especially when we're in positions of privilege, you have to be willing to, and, and I just couldn't say this with any more answers, you have to be willing to bear some cost if mm-hmm. you have a position of privilege. You know, there's just too much in the world of all of us wanting the nice thing to happen, but just not letting it cost us anything. You know, so we have to, you have to know, in your school, you know, what are the punishment rates between children of color and white children? What do they look like? What are the advancement rates? What are the AP rates? What are the mm-hmm. detention rates? What are the expulsion rates? And that means asking principals a bunch of questions that they might then suddenly think, oh, that Roxy, or, oh. It's <laughs> <laughs> a cost you really have to bear. It means that when somebody makes a joke, look, nobody needs to be officious or self-righteous all the time. That's also tiring. But when people make those kind of jokes or make the sly comment about why we shouldn't promote this person, they're not the right kind of person. Or maybe in your workplace, 
the comment is, well, we already hired a black person. We don't need another one, right? As though like, as though like, but it's fine. We've, we've taken care we've of done that. that right? yeah, yeah. We've done that. Right. Yeah. Right. Are, are you the one who's willing to, are you willing to have it have a cost and say mm-hmm. something and, and stand up even when you know you're not going to be the most popular person. But with all that being said, look, I don't think it's true that um, even though I find this incredibly difficult, mm-hmm. obviously it's not going to be the case that we can excise everybody we disagree with from our lives, right? You, mm-hmm. can't, you can't decide that you'll never speak to your mother or family cousin or in-laws again. Um, you know, I don't have great answers to this. Frankly, I find it tiring myself. I only, there are only two answers I can offer. One is you are, you are failing if you allow it to be the job of the people of color in your circle to carry all that weight. Right. Mm-hmm. If, if the idea is that it's there, and I've actually written an article called Whose Burden to Bear. Mm-hmm. If you think the job, think of the cruelty of making it the case that those who bear the most in terms of racial costs should also bear the cost of fixing mm-hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you can't just let it be their job. But secondly, you know, and I'm not very good at this, but the best literature on this stuff shows that the best way to try to get people to see your point of view is to first let them know that you're not, so to speak, enemies, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it turns out that the people who move, for example, Republicans the most on gun rights Mm -hmm. are people who are Republicans who largely share their point of view, right? Somebody who can Mm -hmm. say to them, I get where you're coming from. I, too, worry about an overweening government. And you and I agree on all these things. But do you see how, even though we can agree on X, Y, and Z, unfettered access to AR-14s is actually not something that you and I would need for hunting and Mm -hmm. it's a huge amount of damage. So, you know, that is something that after a while gets exhausting, particularly if your friends of color are the ones who always have to do it. Mm. If you ask me how white people can be successful in actually moving good arguments... It's, I presume it's reaching out the olive branch and then bringing people with you. Um, at, at least that's what a ton of research and probably the best politicians of our generation have shown us. Mm-hmm. You know, and I do see, um, you know, members of the white community who really do want to help and, you know, don't really know how to approach things and how to be, uh, you know, while maintaining the sensitivity and the care that needs to be maintained, you know, they want to, um, to do something and it's, you know, is it enough to, I mean, is it enough to share a post on Instagram? Is it enough to make a donation? Is it enough to go out and march with people? Is it, you know, and I think that's where a lot of that confusion also comes in is what, what, what to do, you know? No, I totally agree with you. Look, I think mm-hmm. one of the things that's really important is you have to ask yourself, why are you doing this? And if mm-hmm. it's a huge amount about virtue signaling, right? If it's, you know, you know, if it's re- look, and it's, it's great to share something on Facebook, mm-hmm. I, I suppose, I think. Um, it's great. To, <laughs> I, I suppose. I mean, I don't, I do it. I'm never <laughs> okay. Um. You know, the, the best thing that can be said about it is that you're not standing in silence. So that's mm-hmm. um, But, you know, if that's the sum total of the cost you're willing to bear, in particular when for most of us, mm-hmm. Facebook or tweeting to a bunch of people who agree with us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you know we, we all have small kids, so that's a better mm-hmm. example. Here's the real question. Are we willing to bear a real cost in our lives? Right. So, you know, when it's, um, you know, the famous examples are the Upper West Side School in New York that is utterly full of liberal parents who are all for all the right values. Um, But when the question comes up as to whether or not they're going to open their doors to allow students from poor neighborhoods Mm -hmm. to actually enter their schools. Right. So, you know, I think. We have to ask ourselves, particularly those of us who are in privileged positions, uh, often white people, but not only white people, right? Those of all of us in privileged positions have to ask ourselves, are we really actually willing to do some work, to bear some real costs for these things? 
And Echo, you said something that really resonated with me. You said it's about consistency. And that's so true because right now there's such a fertile environment to like be on, you know, the, the, the best side and the right side of history and to go out and to like fight and march. And then in a month's time, you're just back to your life and you don't think about it because you don't have to think about it. It doesn't affect your life. And you're so right about it. It, to have real change, mm-hmm. you have to have consistency. It has to be something that's almost daily because if it affects people of color daily, then we need to do something about it daily. It can't just be something that we share 50 million times over the course of the next three days and then we shut up about it, you know? So I think that for me, I realized, I don't know why this was the straw that broke the camel's back for me, but I was just like, what am I doing? I have a platform Mm -hmm. and I, my best friend is from Ethiopia and Phoenix's best friend is from Ghana. So for me, I'm like, we need to do something rather than just talk about it. And it changed for me, this situation. Like I, I don't want to be silent anymore because Mm -hmm. then nothing does change. And my child lives her next generation in the same spot that we are right now. Look, I think that's right. I, I you know, I, I don't want to be hopeless. I'm mm-hmm. truly very happy and very grateful that those who marched in the sixties marched so that someone like me could be a law professor mm-hmm. and those who fought wars, uh, generations before then fought. Um, but you're absolutely right. We can't just enjoy the sort of orgy of virtue signaling that happens when the moments happen. Um, and we cannot, you know, as the popular phrase goes, start a conversation. Okay. I mean, all these sort of banal phrases, you know, one thing we can all do is we can pick a project or two that is meaningful mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. in our community. And we can say, this is something I'm going to be doing for the next five years, right? I'm mm-hmm. not going to do it now when it's cool and popular. I'm going to work with this group of activists to change this thing about policing in my community or this thing about education in my community or this thing about small business loans in my community. Um, and I'm, you know, and, and I'm not going to be the one who, when a racist thing happens, circles the wagons uh, to make sure that nobody feels uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. That no person feels uncomfortable. I'm going to pick a project and dedicate myself to it with some seriousness. Um, yeah. Well, and I think, too, what you're saying is it can be that grassroots, very, you know, local, basic thing that starts, you know, and then grows from there. Because I think that's also another thing that people are thinking, oh, my gosh, I need to do something on a very grand scale. And it can be something like that in your local government or in your neighborhood or something very grassroots like that. No, absolutely. I mean, Mm -hmm. it is because of a very media saturated world, it is very easy for us to focus on. Uh, one person or one place, right? Whether it be 1600 Pennsylvania or Mm -hmm. Washington generally. Um, But your local mayor has more control and effect in your everyday life than any president does. Uh, Your city council has a huge effect on your life, your local police chief or sheriff. And if your local police chief, for example, hears that you no longer want uh, police officers in a school, or you don't want police officers in a school unless they're being a, unless they're under the control of um, the parent teacher association, and that that PTA is represented uh, is reasonably represented by everybody in that community, including people of color. Um, if you let it be known that you'll no longer have the shabby or as how do you the sketchy part of town police, mm-hmm. you would never tolerate for yourself. Um, you know. Of course, you being the two of you being perfect parents would never have a child who came back home having vandalized something or smoked something they ought. And I'm sure you guys will. <laughs> we'll smoke um, it with them. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm like, how'd you get that? Give it to me. No, just kidding. Very anti that. Yeah, my, yeah. my parents are very strict. <laughs> no, I'm definitely the boring conservative one in, in my family, right? So, <laughs> Uh, my children know that dad would rain holy hell on me. Um, yeah. <laughs> but look, the, the question is, it's not because I don't think other kids are doing it, right? So if you let the police chief know that, you know, when one kid is arrested and now has a record, 
Mm-hmm. But gosh, isn't it strange that we all know that when the neighbor's kids were busted, mm-hmm. the police brought them home for a stern talking to, mm-hmm. right? I mean, those are the kinds of focusing on the local level that can change the life of a family and of your community and of their mm-hmm. city. And also to bring the kids in when you um, are involved in these things, really getting your kids involved too from a very early age. Where, what is that point, do you think? What, what's like a good time to get them involved or what age um, or what stage do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a great question. So, you know, mm-hmm. we were at a protest weekend and our mm-hmm. four-year-old, six-year-old were with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I said earlier, it's not fun to take your boys out there and explain that you're marching because the police killed a man. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's especially not fun to explain to young black boys that the police killed a man because he was black. Um, yeah. You know, and like every parent, I want to shelter them from these things. And, you know, it's very boring to say, but black people are just people too. And I'm, you know, the most boring of them. I also just want to watch, for me, 19, obscure 1950s romantic comedies. That, that <laughs> so do I. <laughs> people trade with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to be watching charming people dancing around in gorgeous suits in the Riviera and just mm-hmm. black. Um, but I remind myself that it, my children will be better people, and also better citizens, but better people if they never remember a time when they didn't stand up when it was required. And I try to make it as simple for the, you know, it's, you explain it to a four-year-old, hey, if somebody was picking on your friend, you'd stand up for him, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, it's our job to stand up for each other, right? Hey, you know, you're not really somebody's friend if you're not there when they're in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. Explain it to them in the ways that they understand it. And that helps them get that, you know, we owe it to each other to stand up for each other. Mm-hmm. Every- Will Smith said that racism isn't getting worse. It's just getting filmed. Do you believe mm-hmm. that? Oh, I, I'm sure it's not getting worse. I think the only question is if it's getting mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, one way to put it is this. Mm-hmm. It's probably never been a better time to be a black person in America. Mm-hmm. And this is still as bad as things mm-hmm. are. Right? Mm-hmm. So when things feel now, you should know that, you know, I, I'm, the times I'm frustrated are when I'm teaching criminal law and people say to me, it's been a bad year. I think it hasn't been a bad year. It's been the same year it's always been. It's just now we're seeing it. What are some good resources that, Mm -hmm. you know, that you think will help people like us who are young white moms who can do better and be better and educate ourselves? Like, where do do we go? What do we do? Um, What organizations do we align ourselves with? Where do we donate? Like, what what are the top, top ones for you? Oh, I mean, that's hard. I mean, so look, I'll tell you that the top couple for me, mm-hmm. I'm an, uh, as you mentioned, I'm, a, I'm honored to be on the executive board of the Innocence Project. Mm-hmm. And so that's obviously where a lot of our energy and some of our family resources go to. Um, that's also in part because not only does the Innocence Board, the Innocence Project literally save lives, mm-hmm. but in fact, um, one of the things that the Innocence Project does by making uh, exonerations visible and by changing the mistakes that lead to mm-hmm. people being, uh, being incarcerated, they make it the case that, that there is a client who they don't have to save, right? That there will be somebody who ever goes into jail who has to be, who has to be released. Um, so I think it's one way of helping make, make the entire criminal justice system better. I also work on voting rights with the New York Democratic Lawyers Council. Um, so if people want to Google that, it's a terrific organization, probably the largest, uh, the largest political voting rights organization because it's the New York Democratic Lawyers Council. And we help advise the DNC on voting rights. You know, what I always say to people is whatever your first most important issue is, voting better be your second most important mm-hmm, issue. Mm-hmm. Because if at least as structural as almost anything else. But if I'm really honest, that's because I'm a criminal law professor and a lawyer. Um, you know, my friends who are in business think law is great, but what really needs to change is the economic structure and the wealth gap. And they have a point. My friends who are in education think none of that works unless, you know, our schools are more just and more equitable. 
and they have a point there as well. So, um, so what I would say is whatever you are passionate about, whatever you care about, mm-hmm. and to pick up on what something both of you said, whatever you love enough that you can be sustained about over the next few years, find that organization and, and dedicate yourself to that. You know, you also mentioned it's an election year. Uh, November will be here. Hopefully, I'm a citizen for the first time, Roxy. Yes, Did you know right. I became an American citizen <laughs> she did. four months ago? I'm, <laughs> now I can say what, whatever I want because before I was like, I can't say it because I'm not really an American citizen. Now I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> it's on. She is. Her first voting year, voting uh, election cycle. Yes, very exciting. Um, so predictions, thoughts about this coming election. If you had your crystal ball and you could see, I mean, how do you think that this, especially with what's going on this week, how do you think that's going to play out in the election? Yeah, so, you know, somebody somewhere, uh, one of the, well, actually, what I really consider my alma mater gave me a degree in political science. Uh, the hmm. University of Michigan is my real alma mater. Very, uh, very um, thrilled and proud of my the rest of my education. But alma mater's undergrad, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, okay, go blue. So um, they gave me this degree in political science, and what I've learned over the years is that actually I know nothing about politics, mm-hmm. and if I needed to learn that more, the last presidential election mm-hmm. brought home to me how utterly ignorant I am, um, because. I could not have imagined the result being what it was. You know, having studied a lot about name recognition, I just kept telling everybody, you know, Donald Trump, is, it's a name recognition effect. It'll go away shortly. So what do I know? Um, so I, I'm really, I literally threw away my crystal ball. I, I, I shattered it into a bunch of pieces. I burned it and then I threw it away. Um, what I can say is this, uh, you know, Presumably, there are people from all political spectrums, and you maybe have viewers on, on a range of spectrum. Um, but what I can't emphasize enough is this. When we are blind to the ugliest part of America's racial problems, it hurts everybody, right? This racial test is not, I mean, it is true that black people pay faster uh, and more. But James Baldwin had a famous quote. Uh, during the during the riots in the '60s, they asked him, "Aren't black people suffering more?" He said, "I don't know about that. We're just the ones dying the fastest." Um, you know, when we elect people who are able to stir and focus our resentments the best, and um, and point to white grievances and make it the case that um, anytime we point to real facts about racial gaps, differences, and injustices, Mm -hmm. all you hear is that those Black people want to take away your things. Mm -hmm. Uh, The country suffers, and everybody suffers. It means that when the moment comes, let's take a wild example, and a pandemic sweeps across the land, Mm -hmm. and we're utterly incapable of responding to it because um, our politics is focused on small petty tribalism and um, federal and presidential uh, presidential remarks that say things like uh, if you're not kind to me in Michigan I will not send you help that means that some white person who voted for Trump lost their wife and maybe they don't see it. Maybe they won't see it. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I doubt there's something I can say to convince everybody. But what I am utterly sure of is that the constant betrayal of black people is also to the deep and lasting detriment of white people. Mm. Absolutely. It's something to, uh, to look towards for sure. You said that the conversation that was driving the election, um, was built on inclusivity. Mm. Do you think the people of color were kept out of that conversation that was the driving heartbeat of this, this, the last election? The last presidential election? Yes. I mean, I think it refers back a little bit back to, um, it refers back to what we were talking about, uh, how 
are, we have this inability to see humanity across racial lines. Mm -hmm. So let me just give an obvious example. Um, we had an election that was largely about uh, the poor, forgotten, and left out American worker. Mm -hmm. uh, the blue collar worker in the rust town, what the, what, uh, the president referred to in his inaugural speech as the American carnage. Mm -hmm. and it was that feeling of being betrayed by popular interests and um, being left behind, mm -hmm. you know, mixed in with, you know, a huge amount of just resentment, anger, xenophobia, racism, uh, just this huge skew of things. But the, the thing that was legitimate and forceful in the message was, Trump rightfully pointing out that lots of Americans have been left out of, of um, America's prosperity. Um, but here are a couple of things to notice. When black people have said for literally generations that the black worker has also been utterly left behind, that job programs haven't existed to retrain black workers, that unions didn't allow black workers, that black workers were the first hired, excuse me, last hired and first fired, um, that the gap between white workers and black, black white uh, pay and black pay um, was an institutional problem, that lending practices were unfair. When black workers said all of those things, uh, white America typically responded with saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's all your fault. We're tired of hearing, um, we're tired of hearing uh, people play the race card. Um, so that's a way in which you see how we can care about the person who's hopeless because his, the factory in his mill town closed down. But when the exact same complaints are made by some a uh, black person who, by the way, is suffering, whose community is suffering from much higher unemployment in the middle of Detroit, we turn a deaf ear. Um, and what I want to say is, imagine the country we would have if people would have taken those complaints seriously. Imagine the strength that the unions would have had to have a better deal in NAFTA. Imagine the strength we would have had as a country to, I, I, it, the simplest way to put it is, if white workers would not have turned their back on black workers generations ago, they might have found that the deal wasn't so crappy for them a generation later. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do now. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you constantly ignore the way in which, uh, you know, people use the analogies of the canary in the coal mine or what have you. Mm -hmm. But if you ignore the way in which these injustices are aimed at the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. then it'll come, it'll come to roost. Yeah. Oh, gosh. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, a lot to think about. Like, yeah, it's, it's, not to think about, but to take in. Because, again, I know that I wasn't paying as much attention that I think I should have. And I, I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. And... I just thought it would get better. And because I think sometimes we feel like, well, why go and vote? What does my voice mean? What does it matter? But if everyone feels that way, then nothing changes. And we're sitting in the same place as we are now that we were a generation ago, ago and a generation before that. So, you know, this podcast today was really to be accountable and to talk about it and not just start a conversation like you were saying, but actually follow through with that, follow with, through. Yeah. And yeah. And, um, and for it to have consistency and mm -hmm. like you said, pick a couple of things that really matter and that speak to us, mm -hmm. um, and continue with, with, with that because, um, because yeah, I need to change. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I do too. And I think too, it's, um, it's also getting our kids involved. It's, it's really focusing too on the next generation and teaching them very proactively. It's not enough to just, you know, lead by example. It's not enough to just live a life that you think is, you know, that you're doing all the right things. It's really, really getting in there and teaching them no matter what age they are, you know? And it's interesting because young girl, like, I mean, young children, we had this conversation with my daughter Phoenix yesterday and it's not that she doesn't see color. She sees color, but it doesn't mean anything different to her. 
Um, but at some point it will, because if we're not educating her, um, as to what has happened and our history, mm -hmm. then she's just going to go and her, her environment is going to be shaped by outside sources and not mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and thank you. Know, you. We have to remember, mm -hmm. you know, no, there's no accomplishment to saying our kids don't see color as you point out. Right. Indeed, it's quite impossible, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when your kids walk into a store and everybody serving them is a person of color, when they notice that, you know, the dry cleaners are all this race or, you know, the kids are absorbing this information and they, we do not give them tools with which to, to interpret this. They will come up with their own, right? Mm -hmm. Your child will not be a bad person when she slowly and surely, um, you know, your child doesn't have to be a bad person to slowly and surely internalize all the lessons that America and that, you know, the world, frankly, Mm -hmm. will present to her. She will, you know, it, it's not like my boys set out to be sexist one day when they assume the young lady meeting them in, in the office is the secretary. Mm -hmm. but if I don't actively talk to them about, you know, not making assumptions like that and, you know, why so many women are secretaries or more importantly, if I don't talk to them about what we're doing to, I don't know, make, um, make uh, family work balances possible for women such that not all women have to be lower on the totem pole, mm -hmm. then yes, like every man, they will walk into the office and assume that the woman in front of them is not a junior associate, mm -hmm. but the secretary, right? And the same with race as well. Yeah, it's just these hidden messages. It's funny because my Alexa behind me, you say, you have a nice skirt. It's, it, you look good. And Alexa says, thank you. Because it's these hidden messages that are put in all around us because a certain type of people have designed that so that we think that that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's everywhere, you know? Well, we really appreciate you being on today. I mean, yes, it's, it's been you. so helpful for me. Mm -hmm. um, I promise to do better <laughs> <laughs> yes. in whatever way that is. We will do better. I we think this is the better. first start mm -hmm. um, by having these conversations. I my, you know, I, every day... I also wake up frustrated thinking, what more can I do? So, right. Absolutely. And we just have to keep, we just have to keep going with it. Um, you know, it's not enough to do something for a month or two months and then say, okay, the problem is solved because it isn't. So we should be consistent with it. We should keep doing it. We should teach our children. We shouldn't assume the things that we thought before, you know, because those assumptions aren't correct. We should just try to do better. And we're not perfect. And we're not perfect. We're not perfect, but I mean, I am Roxy. I'm a little oh, bit perfect. Okay. So. <laughs> That's right. I forgot. <laughs> and it's good no. to keep each other accountable too, right. you know, and, and pull your friends into it so mm -hmm. that, you know, one becomes 10 becomes 20 becomes a community of people who are making a difference. Yeah. I also think we, we shouldn't be so scared to stub our toe, right? I mean, mm -hmm. part of doing this is going into places and asking to be of help instead of, mm -hmm walking in and assuming that, well, I'm here now, everybody. I'll, you know, I'll fix this problem, right? Right. <laughs> Part of it is that, you know, even when you have the best of intentions, there'll be moments mm -hmm. where you say something that offends somebody. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many countless people I know who have said and thought they'd be allies just mm -hmm. until the first uncomfortable, unhappy moment happens. And then, you know, with huffed breath it's sort of like well look i tried to help but um mm. you know i said one little thing and nobody and everybody jumped up well no i mean you said an offensive thing and people rebuked you and life goes on um mm -hmm. and if the sum total of your brave allyship is now i'm out then yeah. you know <laughs> you were not going to be the ally anybody needed anyway um so it, it's about in that real sense all of us being really dedicated to making this, um, you know, picking something that you're going to be dedicated to and mm -hmm. showing up day after day after day, month after month. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned more within these last 48 hours than, than I've ever known, you know, watching and reading and listening and talking and um, researching and learning about America's history. Again, I'm from Australia. It's not what I, I learned about Captain Cook in 1770. You know, that's, I didn't know much. I mean, I know on the periphery, um, mm -hmm. American history, but not, 
really the meat and potatoes of it. So, um, you know, even as one person, I think, I think, uh, if we can all do that, Mm -hmm. then we can use our hearts and, and move forward that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I know your time is very precious. You have you're wonderful to come come talk. An artistic wife who draws (laughs) paintings in the back and two great rambunctious kids who come into the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Frankly, a high powered lawyer wife. So I'm nice. Yeah, as busy as I am, I'm the fourth uh, I'm the fourth (laughs) most productive person in my house. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great way to look at it. And that's how to keep everybody happy. <laughs> I asked my, um, I asked someone yesterday, like, what's the secret to, cause he's been married for 20 years. And he said, yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's probably the secret to the happy marriage. <laughs> yeah. Just say yes. Just say yes. That's it. That's it. And, um, echo, where's the best place that f- people can find you? Oh, uh, well, Oh gosh, so I never did. So I, you, I'm on Twitter. I think mm-hmm. it's E A O W N Yanka Y A N K A H. Um, you can always Google the Cardozo website and find me. Um, lots of people who don't like me find me there. So if people <laughs> hit something nice, <laughs> just paint. Um, and I do occasionally write um, for various newspapers. Yes, uh, I've. You know, I've had a chance to write for places like the New York Times and the New Yorker and, and mm-hmm. Huffington Post and places like that. So if you follow me on Twitter, then I'm happy to, to whenever I write something publicly. Um, and indeed, even my academic writing, I hope, is of use to people um, mm-hmm. in things as broad as philosophy and uh, criminal legal theory and political theory as well. Mm. Particularly focused on these kind of questions. What do we owe each other as citizens? What do we owe each other in policing and punishment? Amazing. Thank you so Amazing. much. We really Thank appreciate you so it. much. And uh, we, you can find us on Women on Top Official on Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> and uh, Women on Top Podcast on Facebook. And we are, I'm Tamin Sursak. And I'm Roxy Manning. And we are Women, women on, on Top. top.